We are back, live from Dolly's in Reno, with another update on stunt cyclist Johnny Airtime's progress. Here in Hood River, where Johnny Airtime is making his final preparations, his crew is moving the new launching ramp into position and are quickly rechecking all the timing systems to verify their accuracy. Problems that took months to correct. Once Johnny established his location, his stunt team started building the launching ramp. And Johnny personally supervised every aspect of this construction. Designed at a 60-degree angle, the ramp must withstand the impact of a 200-foot jump through a grueling series of tests. Some planned. Some not so planned. Gotta get the message to him to shut off a little sooner than this. This damage is gonna cost us some time. We need about what 20. We gotta check the whole ramp over now for structural damage. The next step is to see if Johnny could actually clear the height of the train. Baby, okay, this looks like about the height of the train plus maybe a foot of uh, safety margin. We're about 20 feet above the ground, so this will give us something to go by. And if if I, when I jump, just see how much I catch the uh, ribbon, and if I catch it, and uh, then we'll adjust our speeds as required. He started with short jumps in preparation for the long 200-foot leap required to safely clear the train. So far, he hasn't made it. You were about a foot too low. A foot too low? We've got to get another foot and, and more to clear that train? That's pretty scary. Well, we're just going to have to gas a little more, land a little farther down on the landing ramp to clear the back end of this caboose. It's pretty tall. Constant testing quickly took its toll on the landing ramp. Two of the rope in here, the joist hangers just not holding up. We'll probably have to change these two bars horizontally. Yeah, it's holding up under the punishment. The nails are bending. Equipment was breaking as fast as it could be repaired. And Johnny's moment of truth was approaching fast. Meanwhile, engineer Bob was doing his own testing. There's nothing left! I can't believe that! That is devastating. I love it. Can't wait to jump that. Now that's a challenge right there. Look at this debris here. How are you doing, Johnny? Great. I can't wait now. That, that'll get my blood going right there. Look at these pieces. There were pieces of plywood here. Where did they go? Look at that. There's all the wood. <laughs> Not even the locomotive was saved from the strain of all the testing. Hey, we lost the headlight. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah I noticed it. Well, so, will I look anything like this wood if I come up short? Here's the plane. This is what it is, it's a steel. This is solid steel right here. What would it do to the human flesh? Well, we won't get into that. If you're looking at your obstacles, you're taking your eyes off your goals. As the test continued, the problems mounted for Johnny Airtime and his crew. And time is running short. Two things happened after Johnny's last test. One, as if this stunt isn't challenging enough, Johnny's decided to add another obstacle. Instead of an engine and a caboose, they're going to also be carrying a passenger car, bringing the total length to 180 feet. Now, two, because of the damage to the engine, we had to reinforce the front of the train with iron shields to deflect the ramp up and over the engine. And if that thing doesn't look intimidating, I'll tell you, I don't know what does. That's going to be a few minutes before Johnny's absolutely ready to make the jump, so back to you, Reno. Thanks, Greg. The stunt we'll be bringing you live from Reno also involves a ramp jump, but it won't be a motorcycle that's flying through the air. It'll be a semi-truck. Stuntman's name is Spanky Spangler. And just in case you're wondering what type of rig he's chosen to, jump the, to, to make the jump from all the way over there, can you see that? To all the way over here. Believe me, it's not your standard. Go down to the dealer and drive it out of the showroom Peterbilt. 
first of all, it needed to hit 65 miles per hour from a dead stop in six seconds. Secondly, the whole chassis needed to be lowered with a new suspension system that could survive the impact of the landing. In short, it's not the type of stuff you'd entrust to Mr. Goodrich. Spanky needed to build this truck from scratch. They started with a super reinforced frame, a monster engine, and lots of suspension. They ended up with one nasty machine. Spanky's first tests with the truck were conservative jumps to safely work out any bugs. You gotta keep everybody away up here so in case yeah. I get squirrely, I don't wanna be running over anybody. He's approached all of his incredible stunts in the same careful way. The same way he's made a habit of turning doubters into believers. Every time I do stunts, somebody says it's impossible. I like doing stunts. I've been doing it for over 20 years. And every time I do a stunt, I always have variables against me. That's my job as a professional stuntman to put all the variables on my side and make the stunt happen. When I jumped a car in Firebird Lake in Phoenix, Arizona, I traveled off a ramp over 80 miles an hour. My car went over 232 feet, and I landed upside down in the water. I was underwater for over three minutes and 18 seconds without oxygen. I had divers coming in to, to help me recover, but we knew what we had to do underneath the water. It was a very dangerous stunt, but we had all the variables on our side to make that stunt work. I also did another stunt, where we crashed two cars in midair in the Houston Astrodome. We came off ramps and collided 50 miles an hour in midair. We had 27 safety factors in the car, and both of us walked out without a stitch. We looked over our calculations, and I feel 100% confident that we can make this truck jump. Thank you. You know, from listening to Spanky, it seems like jumping a truck 160 feet through the air is a normal, everyday routine. <laughs> well, a lot of that was taped a while back when the stunt was still in the planning stages, and apparently there have been quite a few new problems since the truck has arrived here in Reno. But you're right. These guys don't seem to be shaken very easily by anything. Now, Spanky's wife is here in the audience, and later on, I'm going to see what she thinks about all of this. Frankly, I wouldn't like it. <laughs> You know, if these mechanical geniuses can make a truck fly through the air, you'd think it'd be no problem doing the same thing with a person, right? Well, let's take a look at the human catapult stunt in West Virginia. This is the New River Gorge Bridge, and 900 feet below are some of the most famous Class 5 whitewater rapids in America. Now, from where I'm standing, you're going to see a stunt attempted that is so dangerous that no one has even dared dream of doing it. But first, you're going to meet the man that's going to turn this nightmare into reality, Jake Lombard. I first got the idea when I was doing the stunt work on the James Bond film, The Living Daylights. We were doing work on the net behind the C-130. No one had ever gotten shot from the ground onto a net. And I got the idea of, well, what if, how could you go from the ground through free fall onto the net? More precisely, his scheme is to get catapulted off this massive bridge into a cargo net flying by at 40 miles an hour. No one's ever tried this kind of human target practice before. Grabbing hold of the net may be impossible, holding on even harder. He'll wear a parachute, but that won't guarantee he walks away. When you go off this catapult, you're already on your back, and that's one strike against your right to begin with. The most major cause of malfunction is poor body position on opening, so you need to at least fall two or three seconds to have enough airspeed to turn yourself face to earth and then count on a good clean deployment and then there's a lot of water going by down there the rapids are big down underneath here and the landing area is small and the winds are variable getting airborne would be challenge number one jake turned to stunt engineer kai michelson whose minneapolis based research and design center is responsible for 72 current land speed records when it comes to a good rush he knows what buttons to push. It's something that's new. In fact, it's, it's never been built before. It's, uh, you know, we've all gone to the circus and saw somebody uh, shot out of a cannon. And uh, instead of being inside the cannon, he's sitting on the outside of the cannon. And that makes it unique. And uh, so he can see as the airplane is flying by, and uh, he'll have control as to what's happening. Okay, so Designing a moving target he'd have the best chance of hitting came next. Jake called on his longtime friends and skydiving partners at the Jump Center in Zephyr Hills, Florida, master rigger Jake Brake, 
pilot Tom Crevasse and safety expert Richard Fenimore. Jumpers worldwide have leaped out of a unique and somewhat obscure biplane for years. It's a Soviet-built workhorse called the Antonov AN-2. The big in the Baltic, but only four exist in the entire United States. Jake got one. Well, the Antonov is the slowest flying plane that has enough power that the person impacting the net at a higher speed than the airplane wouldn't take it out of the sky. It has a thousand horsepower engine and giant wings. Jake suspected that pulling his custom-built net would tax even the Antonov's huge engine, but he didn't expect the first test to go the way it did. The net acted more like a sail and nearly pulled the plane out of the sky. The problem we're having that the net was creating so much drag that the pilot was having to use almost all the power that the airplane had just to maintain altitude. To cut drag, Jake Brake had to sew the net's nylon webbing in half, all 700 square feet of it. That would improve the net's performance during the static test. But could the Antonov climb with a man in the net like it would need to in the gorge? You know, I'm just right now kind of pondering for what's going to happen, you know, and what to look for in, in case. And when I was 21 years old, I'd have, I'd have done this, and I'd have said, tie it on one wing, let's go. <laughs> Jake knew there was no way to dummy up this dangerous maneuver. He had to rappel out of the plane and onto the net itself to find out. Hey, Tom, is everything OK for you? Yeah, everything's fine. All right, good. OK. So far, so good. The net test worked, but in the big picture, this was only a shaky first step. Jake's put together one of the best stunt teams and some of the most unique hardware. But like anything that's never been tried before, each step brings on a whole new set of problems. Back to you, Stunt Central. Thanks, David. Right now, it's time to go back to Johnny Airtime in Mount Hood, Oregon, where months of preparation and planning have led up to his attempt at one of the world's greatest stunts. A few minutes ago, you heard Johnny say that obstacles are things that you see when you take your eyes off your goal. Well, like it or not, there's an obstacle that Johnny's going to have to look at before he attempts to jump. Now, while the crew was clearing away what was left of the jump ramp destroyed earlier in the show, they also found a section of the track that may have been damaged in the collision. And you'll remember that this is the only stretch of track that the engineer felt was in good enough shape to safely carry the train at the speed required for the stunt. Now, how bad is the track? Well, I'm not an expert on trains, but the engineer says it's all right. We had a little cushion built into the train's speed, and he feels like we're still within the safety margin for error. How do you feel? I feel like showing everybody what time it is. <laughs> all right. Well, good luck. OK, thanks a lot. Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, 
How you feel? Awesome. That was the most exciting thing. Hey, Fabian, this is Fabian, my crew chief. Hey, Excellent work for five weeks on this thing. That was the most yeah, awesome job I've ever done, man. That was like picture perfect. Thanks a lot. And was that was that technically as perfect as you wanted it to that be, was or was that exactly where I wanted everything to turn out? It's great. Yeah, well, look that way. Tired, I'm sure you saw. Yeah, I think the only thing would have been better if maybe Mount Hood would have erupted exactly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or the train derail. That, that was great, man. Oh, that man. was beautiful. Whew. Well, you know, we don't let fear make our decisions around here, and I hope you won't either. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what's this going to do for uh, for a train jumping? I guess it's going to be a whole new thing. Huh? Well, in 1921, <laughs> Hurricane Hutch jumped the. Uh, the uh, train side to side with no helmet, no suspension. So this is like a tribute to Hurricane Hutchinson. That's great. All right. Well, so the uh, now when you what happened? You had a problem with the you had a problem with the lights or something with the timing system when well, you started. The timing system uh, was was kind of intermittent. The train tracks are kind of uh, in bad shape. So what we did is uh, I've been working with Fabian a lot on hand signals, and he's getting it down, you know, within five one hundredths of a second, and we needed to be within about a tenth uh, to be totally reliable so what we did is uh, got five guys worked them out on it a little bit and uh, it worked out great I, I just led Fabian by about five one hundredths just to be on the safe side and uh, and we put everything right where we wanted it to be so is this, uh, is this like an original idea or is this uh, how do you come up with these kind of crazy ideas huh well we lay awake at night believe <laughs> yeah. me. Uh, yeah. we've got these jumps packs and whatever. Ah, <laughs> no. don't do drugs yeah, don't you can't drink. do that so, yeah it's it's really the most silly. dangerous sport in the world, and yeah. I take it quite seriously. I live for jumping, and I've worked on it since I was eight years old, and I wouldn't recommend anybody to jump ramps. Yeah, don't try this at home. Definitely, seen right. the worst crashes in history in this sport, and uh, by the way, we will be getting more radical. More yeah. and more radical. What's next on the agenda? What's, I we can't gonna... tell you yet, because, you know, it's a competitive business, and uh, I've got, this is the seven wonders of the world of jumping. This is number one right here. All right. Well, we're going to take a look at uh, the replay so All we right, can analyze this. Getting prepared. I'm looking at the flag. The third one hits, and I put it in gear. That's so the clutch doesn't get hot and slip. Come out of the hole. Real good drive. Speed shifting through the gears, motocross style. Pack position. There you go. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> angle. Uh, Motocross experience was the best thing for me. I, I was jumping bicycles when I was eight years old, and I broke the world record 45-footer when I was 14. Started riding motorcycles, got in motocross, and motocross gave me the skills to be within well under a tenth of a second every time. I was more like within uh, four or five hundredths of a second on my drag race times. Okay, we got another picture here, okay. We have about a 10-mile-an-hour headwind at this point that was uh, concerning me just a little. Um, headwinds are the worst, and uh, this Watson nose piece on the front really helped uh, create a low pressure build up under the piece, which uh, brings the front end down. That's great. I think we got another one here. Let's see another angle here. But there's about 40 feet of wood there to get me off onto the railroad ties, and once we're on the ties, it's a pretty rough ride, as you can see. And uh, I didn't even have time to look at my speedometer. I just had to go for it and uh, gas it all the way off the top. That's how we had it plan. Well, hey, congratulations, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> how about let's do it again? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One by one, line up in the back. <laughs> okay, we're gonna toss it to Reno. All right, what do you think? Would you say that qualifies as one of the world's greatest stunts? Yeah! I thought so. And that's just the beginning. Don't go away. Coming up, a death-defying high dive from a New Zealand waterfall. A human bullet aimed at a Russian airplane. All this and more when we continue live, the world's greatest stunts. trying to keep a very strict time schedule when someone jumps a motorcycle over an oncoming train you just have to stop for a minute and take another look we were really prepared in this stunt we were here for five weeks working on this thing and uh, good luck happens when preparation meets opportunity here it comes train to the ramp to see me jump right over the top off to the side just a slight bit at the back 
about any of those hurricanes. There's pieces of wood flying everywhere. Here we go from your point of view, Greg. Looks like you're more tense than me. Looking back and forth. Here we go, that train's gonna eat me up. Oh, just missed. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> That felt great. You can see Fabian's elbow on the left here. We'll see him throw the last flag. There he goes. We've got about just over seven seconds for this train to hit the ramp. Yeah, it's kind of high on the ramp. Yeah, I'm feeling good right there. Boy, what a great feeling. I saw that. I took the time during the flight to look at the train going under me. Yeah, that crowd was screaming. I was really happy, stoked. Yes. Well, before we go any further, I'd like to introduce someone very, very special. Now, you might think he's just the test dummy who gets thrown out of helicopters or smashed into walls, but around here, he's known as Roy Sands, stunt scientist. So, Roy, what does it take to become a superstar like yourself? Well, sure. One, a luxurious dressing room. Two, a top makeup artist. And three, a uh, darn, I never can remember. I are passive. For stunt cyclist Johnny Airtime, it's time to celebrate. But for the rest of our stuntmen, the challenge still lies ahead. Let's check in with Ken Ober, my good buddy, on a show called Parenthood on another network. He's on location in New Zealand. Welcome back to Huyua Falls in New Zealand, where stuntman Bob Brown is about to go for a record-breaking dive. With the help of local divers, Bob and John surveyed every possible detail of the falls. The falls have claimed 12 victims in recent years, and Bob has no intention of becoming the unlucky 13th. How's that look, Johnny? Well, on the east side, we got the rocks, OK? OK. The other side, we got the ledge. But underneath, we got the current. There's a lot of water falling down there. Bob Brown has been working with John Epstein for over 10 years. As they'll be the first to tell you, stuntmen don't last very long without a trusted safety man they know they can count on. There's a fire explosion that I was supposed to jump through. And when the fire explosion happened, it filled up the car with a gas fire. And when he landed, this car was totally, totally engulfed. But believe me, when I was going through that car, running out of air, and everything was burning up, it was, it calmed me down knowing that he'd be there. I just knew he would be there. Moments ago, we sent our stunt dummy, Roy, over the falls. And Bob, you weren't too happy with the results, were you? No, what Roy did and what I need to do are two different things. A lot of people think that if you jump, that you're going to continue your same arc on the same trajectory. But what happens as you go out and you get to a certain distance away from where you were jumping, you'll drop just like a ton of bricks. As you can see, despite its beauty, this waterfall can be very deadly. Now back to you, Stunt Central. Ken. Finding the best locations for tonight's stunts was not only one of the most important elements of planning this show, it was also the most difficult. Every stunt had a completely different list of requirements that had to be met, and that limited the possibilities considerably. Getting permission to perform the stunts narrowed the options even further. But for B.J. Worth, there were no options. His stunt had to take place deep in the jungles of Mexico because there was no other place like it on Earth. B.J. Worth is the ultimate skydiver. He's the national director for the United States Parachute Association. He holds eight skydiving records, three world championships, plus he did major aerial stunts in the last five James Bond films. When you ask him what he likes to do in his spare time, BJ says, jump. tropical jungle about 300 miles north of Mexico City. 
Now, this uh, area has no real roads, only ancient paths that have been worn down through the generations. As a matter of fact, the people here don't even speak Spanish. Instead, they speak an ancient dialect known as Huasteco. Now, uh, in Huasteco, the black hole has an interesting legend all of its own. Many centuries ago, when the kingdom of the sun was conquered by the Spaniards, their padres decided to destroy the old god's power. The head priest stole a sacred emerald from the temple, a gleaming rock as big as a green pepper, and threw it into the black hole. The hole swallowed up the power of the god, and the ancient kingdom was conquered. That's the legend. Sotana de las Golandrinas. Right here. <laughs> DJ, that is incredible. Oh my gosh. You can't even see the bottom. I've never seen anything like that in my life. It's 165 feet wide at the opening and 1,400 feet down to the 11 acres at the bottom. BJ, this is the biggest cavern on the face of the planet. Now, the experts told me that you could fit the entire Empire State Building in this hole and still have room for parking. We're now hovering at around 300 feet. Later, from this height, BJ Worth will jump right into this chasm Free fall through the earth at 95 miles per hour for the world's first subterranean free fall. It's the most dangerous stunt he's ever attempted. You've never seen anything like this in your life. Don't go away. ago that a show starring the world's greatest stuntmen wouldn't have been possible. Stuntmen weren't stars. They took the place of stars when a scene got dangerous. Stuntmen were virtually unknown to the audience until about 27 years ago, that is, when a young man came along and started to change all of that. In the 1973 film Papillon, after a lifetime spent in a penal colony, the character played by Steve McQueen will make his final bid for freedom. A fledgling stuntman named Dar Robinson takes the dangerous 100-foot leap from the cliff into the shallow surf below. In magnum force, Clint Eastwood, in a motorcycle duel, outwits a corrupt policeman. Again, Dar Robinson takes the fall. Throughout the following years, there were few movie stunts that Dar Robinson wouldn't master with relative ease. But he wasn't content to do things the traditional way. He wanted to expand the horizons of his profession, with safety always a foremost concern. I need him to move it over because I'm not lined up. Last time I see I don't like landing on a seam. There's something about seams that really bother me. When you hit a seam and it separates, that's it, you go to the ground. And going to the ground here in Atlanta, Georgia, is going to be one long fall. What's going to be happening is I'm going to be backwards, except 150 feet up. This is a practice, a rehearsal. The stunt for the Burt Reynolds film, Sharky's Machine, calls for Dar to crash through the 16th floor window. His specially designed airbag will break the fall only if hit just right. Yeah. He tests it from lower floors first. Let's give her a little laxity. Make a little softer. Yeah, because she's just hitting like a ton of bricks. So, all right, we'll set her up one more time. The foremost high fall man in the business, Dar will only make the full 160-foot jump when Bert calls action. This is the first film the two had ever worked on together. The headache. <laughs> I asked for Dar. Okay. Because we had a stunt that was the climax of the movie, and we had done quite a few gags uh, before that, and we had to top them all. 6 a.m., 
the morning of the film's major stunt. I tell you what, it ought to be interesting. It's the first time I've ever come out backwards uh, from this height. <laughs> And I, I figure I can hit the bag. I just kind of wonder how I'm going to hit it. Father, I don't care how you hit it. As long as you get up, jump over, and run over, and grab me afterwards and say it was fun all the way down. Oh, I promise. I promise. I hope so. Wearing a face mask of the villain he's doubling doesn't make things easier. By falling backwards out of the window, there will be that critical moment when Dar can't see his airbag. Oh, good to me. Okay, roll camera. Roll camera! Shooting inside of the hey, oh, yeah, Both men wanted to work together again, but Dar was looking for a new challenge and pressed Bert to give it some thought. Dar said, well, I want to be an actor. And I thought, well, okay, so I said, well, I'll, well somewhere down the line, I'll find a part for you where you can act and eventually we'll blow you out of, <laughs> out of window or something. So uh, the script came along. I mean, it wasn't a small part, it was a big part. I was concerned about whether he could do it, but I wasn't nearly as concerned as the studio was. What you looking at? I never saw anybody with bunny eyes before. And when I finally made up my mind that he was going to do it, there wasn't anybody that could talk me out of it. This time, the climax to the film called Stick would be from the 22nd floor of a Miami building. Both Dar and Bird wanted the killer's death scene to be so original it would stun the sophisticated action movie fans. What Dar came up with was truly a film first. Yes, I'm going. But then the stunt became so dangerous, it was, it was beyond belief because he was going to go off this building backwards with no airbag. What's the matter, bunny eyes? Losing your grip? Please help me. Why don't you push real hard? You might hit the water. A 200 foot fall with no airbag, no net to stop him. How was it done? Well, with great ingenuity. Rigging, testing, and rehearsing would take weeks. Dar had to deal with the pressures of acting an important role. At the same time, overseeing every detail of his most ambitious movie stunt to date. Gary. Yes, Dar. We're secure here. Let's go for our first test. Kenny, how high are we off the ground? like 10 feet. He had this incredible ability to almost be alone in thousands of people. I mean, he was able to just his concentration of who he was, who, who he thought he was. Roll camera. And I think he was right about who he thought he was. He was, he was a very, very confident man. The elaborately engineered action has been fully tested. In theory, all systems are go. So Dar himself, from a lower floor, will give it the first human test. Two, one, he's gone. Oh, glad baby, come to me! No airbag, no net, but a wire attached to his ankle and chest to break the fall. A complex hydraulic system decelerates his velocity in the final seconds. He rehearses with a safety rope as a backup a luxury he won't have for the stunt itself. The final day of filming, Dar's hazardous stunt has had to wait until he completed all his other acting. The multi-million dollar picture would not have been given insurance coverage otherwise. I felt very strongly that uh, 
that maybe I'd bitten off more than I could chew. I was getting very, very concerned about it. And I kept trying to read something in his eyes, you know, that would tell me that this is not a good idea, you know, but there wasn't a hint that he had a make sure everything second right. where he didn't think this was going to go off to perfection. There wasn't a doubt. There also wasn't a doubt that it was unbelievably dangerous. Okay, I'll take a minute to myself. I'll be out for makeup, contact lenses. I am afraid of most all the work that I do. Anybody who says that they're not afraid of this type of work is either foolish or crazy. Let me know uh, about a, a minute before you're ready to go, okay? Because I want to get everybody up here. Uh... I don't want to get on the rail until we are ready, just in case I get a sweat. No, I understand. Okay. But I want to let everybody up here know, too. Uh, yeah. You better test our cameras, don't you think? Yes, yeah. sir. Everybody test the Everybody cameras. test their cameras, please. Okay, we're going to bow our heads and take a moment of prayer. Um, whether you believe in the man upstairs or not, this is for Dar, okay? Okay, he yeah. said he is. He's ready. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Stay right down there, guys. Now, only an eighth inch wire will be used to break Dar's fall. Anything thicker might be seen by the camera. But the wire could get tangled. It could snap. And I remember just before he did it, he said, should I empty the gun on the way down? No, no, think about the gun. Just, you know, just do whatever you got to do. And he said, no, I think this guy would empty the gun. I'm more fight, okay? okay? Here we go. Maybe you want here to we go, guys. Right We're rolling. Here we go. Roll all your cameras, please. Dar has his most dramatic scene to play, falling backwards 20 stories toward concrete. His concentration must be total. His faith in his crew and equipment is great. Boy, I tell you, my heart was in my throat. I mean, I, it was unbelievable. It was, uh, it was thrilling. It was terribly thrilling. It was scary. It was thrilling, and, and uh, I think every guy in the crew felt the same way I did. Everybody felt uh, like we'd all been a part of something that was quite unique. position I was going to be in, I have no idea. I, I think I kind of cuffed it and just kept this part of my body like this still. Well, you were working all the way down. All the way I down. fired all six shots. I know. After seeing that example of Dar Robinson's genius, we figured out how to come up with a show full of the world's greatest stunts. Let the stuntmen write the script. And right now, we're going to witness the deadly personal challenge that took high fall artist Bob Brown halfway around the world. Let's go to Ken Ober in New Zealand. Bob is just about ready to take his die. It does look quite dangerous standing here looking at a 100 or over 100 foot waterfall. He's now got rocks to contend with. He's got the rapids. He's got the undertow. Any of them could be potentially life threatening. Uh, all we can do here on the ground is wish him good luck. He's not going to make it. Bit of, a, bit of a drop, I tell you. This uh, pond down here is seething with these giant eels. Six foot, two foot diameter type. Big one. I think it's a great idea if he gets away with it. We've just gotten the official word from John Epstein that Bob Brown is ready to go. This is it. Just seconds before I'm going to do a big stunt, I think of calming myself down. Your instincts are telling you I want out. If you think about it, you're right on the threshold of mass hysteria. That's the difference between a stuntman and your average guy.
diving competitions no one has ever successfully executed a quad somersault with a one and a half twist but bob brown did just that and he did it from a 100 foot waterfall in new zealand we'll be right back with more amazing world records after this still ahead stuntman jake lombard goes airborne trying to catch a passing plane spanky spangler lives up to his legendary reputation on live the world's greatest stunts record for the first time a 100 foot quad somersault has ever been executed and stuntman bob brown did it let's take another look okay let's take a closer look at bob brown's incredible record-breaking dive that was somersault number one at the top there entering into somersault number two and incorporating the one and a half twist they're, they're beginning somersault number three Oh, it was awfully close. Wow. There's number four. Amazing, amazing, truly incredible stunt. That's crazy. <laughs> he makes it look so easy, but it's important to remember that Bob Brown is a professional stuntman, and all the stunts you'll see on this show are performed by Hollywood's top professionals. And no matter how easy they make them seem, under no circumstances should these extremely dangerous stunts be attempted by anyone watching this program. In other words, don't try this at home, kids. And just in case you need a little visual reaffirmation to prove how dangerous these stunts are, let's take a look at the challenge Jake Lombard faced in West Virginia. Jake's challenge is this, to get shot high enough off the bridge so he can catch the Antonov's cargo net without getting knocked out or hung up. His catapult engineers came up with this, the Acceleride. It's more like a pistol with a seat on top than a cannon. The nitrogen tanks, valves, and high pressure lines come from the NASA program. They can all handle over a thousand pounds per square inch. That much potentially lethal pressure has raised some concerns. It can push a man uh, about 35 miles an hour and 10 feet. So it makes quite a ride. And uh, you know we've been breaking some of the parts while we've been testing it. And one of the things we're really worried about is if the, the cable, the safety line should break, uh, it could go off the ram itself and follow uh, Jake into the canyon and possibly hit him and knock him out. Of course, that would kill him. Guess what? Jake let Roy take the first couple of rides. Three, two, one. So that was 26 feet, if we could get, uh, was that 26? That's 26 feet. 26 feet, I'd say a minimum of 40 feet we need to get off of here with 200 pounds. Because with my rig on, I'm going to weigh probably just over 190 pounds. Yeah, we'll lean on a little bit harder and see where we're at. And if not, that's what we that's what we got, and that's what we need to work with, right? Actually, I think he's in critical condition, guys. Yeah, Yeah, we might have to just about, this might be Roy's last ride. Hey, it's yeah. just a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> One thing Roy couldn't tell the team was how Jake's body would handle the G-force of the Accelerite. Safety testing shifted to nearby Summersville Lake, where both a rescue boat and paramedics were standing by. Feet, knees, nose. 
something like this is how you want to go into it. Just like the same thing. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how it's going to go. How much pressure are we going to go with? 300. Can you do a short countdown so I don't have to sit there and anticipate? OK, you want to go with three? <laughs> yeah, like three to one go. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. The first test clearly fell short of the mark. Okay, where do we want to go from here, guys? Another 100 up? Yeah. Okay, let's go 400. Each step up, the pressure gauge shot Jake closer to the 40 feet he need to safely clear the bridge. But the chair was launching him feet first, a dangerous way to hit the net. To make things worse, the Antonov couldn't execute the crucial timing runs they needed over the lake without risking dipping the net and crashing. We all have this risk that we're involved with in doing this thing and the closeness that it is and, and the dangers involved for both of us. So I really, I feel like he's in his element that he knows how to do best and I'm in my element to do what I know how to do best and I think that makes a pretty good team. Tom's had to limit his flying to the bridge. He'll practically have to scrape the wingtip doing 40 to give Jake his best chance at reaching the net. Back at the lake, Kai's crew has completed modifications on the Accelerite's chair, just in time for the weather to turn. Are we ready? This is the most pressure we've put in so far. We're going up to 800 pounds. 800 pounds. 800 pounds. All right, so that'll be one heck of a ride. Like Arm. Hand against the rat. Check. Three, two, one. <laughs> They've broken the 40-foot mark, but Jake's still flying feet first, and they're running out of options. Now, because I'm back in the chair, my feet are still up here. But when I put the parachute on, my feet are going to be back a little more. We might even want to sit on there tonight or in the morning and just move the foot pegs back. Okay. You know, I don't want to hit it with my feet first because I no, really don't want no. my feet to go through and the holes no, are plenty no. big. There's, you know, four one-foot sides to that square. My whole body will go through that. And I've already been stuck in the net. It's pretty easy to get stuck. Yeah. Adjusting the launch chair further forward would help keep his feet behind him, but it would also change the angle of thrust and could shatter his spine. It'll be a sleepless night for the Accelerate crew. I just have to see how it is. It's one of those things that no one's ever done before. Jake's been slapped, strapped, rattled, and dunked. But he still hasn't found all the answers. That'll only come when they crank this baby up to full power and hope that their timing is as good as their engineering. While we're waiting to see the final preparations from West Virginia, we wanted to give you an update on the stunt you'll be seeing right here, live from our Reno home base. To start, Nia's out in the audience with Spanky Spangler's wife, Candy, to get her opinion of the truck jump. Candy, you gotta tell me this, because I know every woman sitting in the audience here wants to know, what's it like being married to a stuntman? It's pretty exciting. We travel all over the world. We get to see, and we get to do a lot of things. Does it put a lot of pressure on your relationship, though? I mean... Yeah, but it, it pulls us closer together. Well, that's good. How does he feel about you sitting in the audience while he's attempting this incredible thing here? Well, it's a question you really have to ask him, but I wouldn't want to be no other place but here. Does it, but is it a support to him? Oh, yeah, it's a support. As, as, as opposed to making it nervous about it. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever thought about being a stunt woman yourself? No, not really, because I don't think I have the instinct for it. No? You just want to stand on the sidelines yeah. and support? Yeah. That's a big job. That is. That's a real big job. Are you in on the beginning when you plan the stunts, when he's planning what he's going to do? Do you help him out with that? No, not really. He plans all of his own stunts. You just stand there like yeah. this? <laughs> I know. Now, what's the most frightening stunt that he's ever done besides the one he's going to do today? Well, most of his stunts are all pretty scary. Probably the hardest one was Firebird Lake because he was underwater for so many minutes. Oh, that, yeah. So how, what helps you get through that? I mean... I pray a lot, and I have everybody at home praying. That helps you get through a lot yeah. of things. Well, thanks, Candy. You're welcome. Now, a few days ago, we got the chance to meet the rest of the family, and uh, we're going to find out how the kids feel about their father's job. He, like, crashes cars, jumps off of buildings, and I think he's crazy. <laughs> 
Okay, so jumping through a wall of cars seems crazy. It's really not so crazy, though, if you've spent your entire professional life getting it right. Which might make you wonder, does Spanky plan to pass down his legacy? I'll do the crashing. My kids can do this. <laughs> I do not want anybody in my family to become a stunt person. And the reason for that is I was born with a God gift. And I have an insight instinct, and I don't know if everybody has that. And I wouldn't want to try to teach somebody that. Jumping this Honda Odyssey at the Houston Astrodome is the only time Spanky's ever been seriously hurt. He broke his leg. He rides the same Odyssey with his kids for fun out in the desert but strictly forbids them from trying their own heroics. I mean, they watch me jump out of seas, and I try to teach them safety. I would hate for them to go out there and try something that they might see me do and they're not familiar with. You can turn over any time and not be prepared for it. When I do a stunt, I'm prepared for it. Brian! All right, you almost went over the top back there. Did you like it? Be careful, you did the right thing. Stay with it, all right? Give Christy a little bit more room. Okay, get a little bit too close to her, all right? You having fun? All right. Yeah. Most parents have at least one ultimate lesson in life to share with their kids. Spankies shouldn't surprise you. They can survive. They can survive. Okay, Spanky still has a little preparation time left before he attempts to jump, jump his rocket truck across the 160 feet that separates these two ramps. So right now, let's give aerial specialist Jake Lombard center stage for his attempt at one of the world's greatest stunts. Okay, the pilot's going to do a flyby right now. He put some rubber tires up here because there's some sharp edges and if one of the net pieces of the net caught it he'd do a cartwheel right in the net and if that happens me and the cameraman and the crew we're going to do a, our famous steve mcqueen belly flop right over this concrete divider right now okay here he comes tom when you dropped in over the bridge the net was I think dangerously close to those unprotected guardrails. Okay. Tom has his hands full with that net flying so close to the bridge. The wind has kicked up this hour, and a strong gust could send the Antonov into the deck with no warning at all. Like I say, be real careful. Every move you make, you know what it is, slow. I'm ready, Freddy. You better be. We're going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Down below, the river's swollen over eight feet in the last few hours from recent rains. That's reduced the size of the emergency landing site to an extremely small target. The rescue boat's in position. So are the paramedics on shore. Ropes, lines, valves, electronics, pressure. I think we're ready to go. All right. When you get back, I'm buying, OK? Great. I'm All right. drinking. All right. All right. Okay, here comes the plane. It looks like this is a go. but at least 
his chute open. He still has to clear the rapids, though. Yeah! Pretty close to that net, actually, uh, maybe a meter away. It looks scary as shit from up here. What was it like? It was pretty cool. I went off of there and kind of on my back, just like we did in the lake, and my feet almost hit the net. Hey, man, I know how much you wanted to hit the net. Hey, can you take another shot at it? Uh, yeah, I'd try it again. Uh, the only thing is, uh, puts me feet first right towards the net. And, uh, I might be able to hit it and you know, hang on, but I, I was just at the very bottom. My feet just kind of went right up to it, and then I fell off. So, uh, I'm not sure if I can get it with my hands, but I almost touched it. The uh, flight crew is radioed in, and uh, they want a briefing at the airstrip. OK, uh, I'll get it right up from here as soon as I can. Incredible. I'm sure Jake is relieved that he made a safe landing, but he's got to be pretty disappointed about missing the net. I mean, after all the testing and rehearsal to get the accelerides throw up to the 40 feet needed, it looked like it put him just short of the target. Now, you heard that the pilot had called for a meeting with Jake to decide if they could make another attempt. Well, we'll take a break now, and you'll find out when we return. Still to come from Mexico, a parachute jump below the surface of the Earth, and our rocket truck begins its final countdown. All this and more on Live, the world's greatest stunts. Brought to you by Little Caesars Pizza. Pizza, where you always get two great pizzas for one low price. Okay, now let's go back to West Virginia to see what Jake and the aerial team decided to do. Whoa, man, that was unbelievable. Uh, you should have seen my view. You can't believe the sight uh, I saw you coming by the airport. Man, I'm like glad to be standing here, bro. Oh, you right came, that wing went by. The first thing I saw was an empty catapult, and you came right under the edge of the wing. I, I couldn't could... believe it. Well, what do you think, Tom? Can we do that again? Can we go any slower, or can we get closer to the bridge? What do you think? How'd that plane feel to you? I just don't think we could do it any closer and any slower and be safe about it. Yeah, and I think if we change that angle anymore, the net would probably just kill you, coming by too fast. Well, it looks like we gave it our best shot, huh? Yeah, it was a hell of a try. It was a hell of a stunt, too. A hell of a stunt. All, All right. right. You were wild. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Reno, uh, this is the problem, as I understand it. The plane has got to do about 45 miles an hour to stay up in the air. And they shot him off at about a 30-degree angle to the bridge so he could, like, catch up to the net. And that would cushion his impact. Uh, now, if they change to a, a more direct launch into the net, say, like, 75 or 90-degree angle, well, he'd have a better chance of hitting it straight on, but that would, like, that would kill him. Uh, remember, this is the first time this has ever been tried, and it's very, very exciting. And uh, Jake's coming up to join us. Oh, hi. Oh, nice to be here. Oh, oh, right. Jake, man, that was so hairy. <laughs> what a ride. Woohoo! Whoa, what was it like? Oh, it's like all of a sudden you're just shot out there into nothingness, and, and then that just went right on by too fast. I just couldn't get to it, you know. It's, uh, yeah, it would have been a one in a million shot. I yeah. wish I could have grabbed it, but it just was kind of going away from me. And, uh, <laughs> oh, man. So the next thing is to save yourself. Uh, okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to buy, baby. All right, all right. Let's get you. See you at the bar. You bet. As disappointed as we all are that Jake's stunt wasn't successful, I'd be willing to bet that no one is more disappointed than Jake himself. No matter how much preparation and planning goes into these stunts, there are always potential problems. 
And the most important preparation these men make is what to do in case of an accident. As part of tonight's show, world champion water skier Jeff Carrington was scheduled to perform a stunt ski jump from Australia. Yesterday, during the taping of the stunt, a serious accident occurred, which resulted in Jeff's hospitalization. His condition is critical, but stable, thanks largely to the emergency preparations planned in case of an accident. Jeff, our love and prayers are with you. And right now, we have to move on, because we still have two more stunts to perform. So let's go back to John Schneider in Mexico. As impressive as the black hole is from up here, the view from the bottom is even more spectacular. But nothing can prepare you for what it's like when you take your first look into that 1,400-foot hole. Oh, great. <laughs> what have you got me into? <laughs> Still, it took a simple demonstration from the cavern's edge by world-renowned caving expert Rick Bridges to give BJ a true sense of the black hole's enormous size. Bombs away! That's 1,400 feet straight down. Wow. <laughs> the next step was for Rick to give BJ a closer look at the hole itself. Rick is one of only a handful of specialists who understand the dangers of extreme vertical caving. Originally, we thought I'd come right through the center of the hole. Looks like now I'll have to probably come right by the edge where the rope is now. If I come in along one edge, I'll probably have more maneuvering room because when I open my parachute, I'm immediately going to shoot forward about 25 miles an hour. In fact, I'll probably have to fall at least 400 feet below the surface to get down to where the cave opens up wider. Until we get back up to the States and do some tests, we're not really going to know for sure. At our stunt test site in California, BJ used our stunt dummy, Roy, to test the accuracy of hitting a 165-foot opening from over 300 feet up. That can't happen to me. I mean, if it's this windy, I can't jump. I think he's going to be OK. Some of the initial testing was anything but reassuring. I'm not sure what happened, but right on the opening, it just lurched to the left pretty good. All of a sudden, I'm going this way, which means I may move my exit point here to the center, because if that happens, I'm in trouble. All right, BJ, you've been here now for three days uh, preparing for this. Uh, how does it feel? I mean, every, every day is closer to the day, closer to the minute. Well, this stunt is like none I've ever done before. There's a much more sense of danger. Uh, there's not very many outs. Every day I go to that cave and I look in that hole, and I, my heart starts beating faster, and there's uh, a sense of anxiety looking at this thing. Yeah. Um, we're doing the tests, and every day I get more confident we can do it safely. But uh, it's um, a feeling I can't describe of what's going on inside because this is, there are no outs. And this is a test drop. They're dropping a dummy to make sure where BJ wants to fall. We're getting close to the jump time and there's still major problems unsolved. Number one, the hole is only 165 feet across. Now that's a small target when you're up in a copter looking down. Number two, a helicopter itself is a difficult machine to keep stationary. It needs very stable wind conditions and an expert pilot. test dummy fell down, it came very, very close to the edge of that wall over there. Now, what that means is if that were BJ, he takes a risk of actually hitting the wall, or even worse, if he's facing the wrong way and he pulls his chute, he'll wind up being thrust into the wall at 25 miles an hour, and that's not good either, so I don't think that BJ's going to be real happy with that test. Uh, the helicopter is going to go refuel, and we need to uh, save these batteries. Now let's go back to Reno, Nevada.
<laughs> I don't know about you, but the more I see and hear about all the work that went into these stunts, the more amazing they seem. And these guys do this all year long. When we come back, it'll be Spanky Spangler's turn to dazzle as he launches his rocket truck on a 160-foot flight through space. Don't go away. Coming up, from the deepest jungles of Central America, the world's first subterranean freefall, and America's top stunt driver takes on a challenge that's wilder than anything he's ever attempted on Live, the World's Greatest Stunts. Spanky Spangler has moved the rocket truck up near the takeoff ramp where he's been going over a few last minute details, checking the truck's acceleration and familiarizing himself with the approach path that he's going to take up to the ramp. Now he's run into one major problem though, and that's the wind. Um, major crosswinds have been kicking up around the building, right in the area of the takeoff ramp. And it's causing a lot of concern around here. So uh, while we figure out what we're going to do and what the other options are, we're going to go back to John Schneider in Mexico. Down here at the Black Hole, filming a television production takes on an entirely new dimension. The eight-man tent on the left side of your screen gives you some idea of the enormous size of this cavern. Now, our camera crew has been living down there 1,400 feet beneath the surface of the Earth for the past three days preparing for this stunt. The dedication and planning required to accomplish a stunt like this would be overwhelming even under normal circumstances. But when the setting becomes the jungles of Central America, the task becomes all but impossible. From the moment I arrived in Mexico, I knew we had our work cut out for us, but I was totally unprepared for the problems we'd soon encounter. Our guide, John O'Leary, has lived in Mexico for the past 15 years. He's an expert on local customs and terrain. The first lesson I learned is that in this part of Mexico, nobody's an expert on local customs and terrain. But John's taste in local restaurants was impeccable. What else you want with? Tortillas. Begay worms? Mm -hmm. What worms? Begay worms. No. <laughs> no. Hold the, hold the begay worms. Okay. We switched to a more comfortable vehicle for the final approach to base camp. This is the good part of the road? Yeah, this is the good part of the road. When we finally arrived, most of the crew had already settled in, and we wasted no time in pitching our own deluxe accommodations. Getting two tons of equipment into this remote section of Mexico was quite a chore. But getting the equipment down to the hole proved to be a completely different animal. <laughs> Few outsiders have traveled these treacherous trails, but the local Indians have been using them for thousands of years. All right, while the cave team makes final preparation for BJ's spectacular subterranean freefall, let's go back to Stunt Central in Reno. Here in Reno, Spanky Spangler has been in the final, final moments of preparation for his attempt at jumping this 160-foot chasm in a semi-truck.
before any stunt is performed, the stuntmen and the producers of the show must both agree that the conditions are well within the margin of safety. And it's clear that as far as the rocket truck jump is concerned, that agreement is in question. The problem is the wind. It's been picking up steadily. We're going to see if there's a possibility that they can try the stunt a little later. In the meantime, we're going to go to commercial and see if the conditions improve. Up next, the most dangerous challenge ever faced by world champion skydiver B.J. Worth. A 95-mile-per-hour freefall into the black hole of Mexico. Stay tuned for more Live, the World's Greatest Stunts. Roy Sands here in my ultra-mega-copter, hovering over a bottomless canyon 6,000 miles deep. <laughs> 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 Thank you for getting this wind. It's, it's coming and going, and it's swirling. And it's too dangerous. I can't let you go now. I know you're ready to go. I know you want to go. But we can't take an unnecessary chance. It's too dangerous. I can't let you go now. Gary, I can make this. I, I know you can't, can Spanky. I'm sorry. But if the conditions yes, were perfect, I'd let you go. I can't let you go right now. Okay, we're back in Reno at the spot where the rocket truck was supposed to begin its approach to the jump ramp. That jump is still in doubt, however, as Spanky Spangler and executive producer Gary Benz try to determine the stunt's feasibility. Guys, Gary, what have you decided? The wind is coming and going. It's swirling around here, and right now it's calm, but two minutes ago, it was blown to flags at the end of the ramp straight out. And Spanky's ready to go. He wants to go. He doesn't feel the wind is going to be too big of a factor, but I can't take that chance. That wind could blow him off his down ramp, and we'd have a big crash, and I don't want him to take that chance. It's too dangerous. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Spanky. We're all real sorry that things worked out this way for Spanky Spangler. I'm sure he understands better than anyone the dangers of jumping under adverse conditions. Despite the setback, we still have an incredible finish for tonight's show. Let's go right back to John Schneider in Mexico for B.J. Worth's attempt to conquer the black hole. Hey! Okay, we just got the word. The helicopter's on its way back after refueling. It's a go! You can see that BJ is going over all the last-minute details with his stunt crew before we go. And let me tell you, he's not just double-checking or even triple-checking. As a matter of fact, I've lost count of how many times he's checked out every detail of this stunt. Okay, here comes the chopper. Our pilot, Henry, is one of the very best. Watch how close he's got to come in around these rocks and trees to pick BJ up. I don't know how this looks at home, but it is very dangerous. This morning it looked pretty good, but about an hour ago the wind started picking up. We've all got our fingers crossed that the wind won't get any worse. Now, while the chopper gets into position, I want to give you an idea of just how difficult it is to film this stunt. We've got a lot of very professional people sticking their necks out to make it all possible. There's three cameras down in the hole. Now, remember, they've based down there for three days. We've got two cameras hanging from the ledges at the lip of the hole, two out in the field, one balanced on the skid of the chopper, and BJ has two on his helmet. That's ten cameras, one try at a very difficult stunt. The helicopter's approaching the left. All right, it looks like we're going to do it. is, but it looks like they're going to abort. It looks like BJ's worst fears have been realized. I've got to keep my nose headed straight into the wind. I'm going to have to bring it around from the other side. Okay, we'll give it another shot. Just keep me off that wall. That's the permit. This is wild!
I don't believe that. <laughs> that was great. I've never had a stunt like that in my life. I've never really did. That was really good. Woo! Wow. That was like a great That was by far the most awesome stunt I've ever done and probably ever will do. Well, I'll tell you, my friend, you look great going by, and when looking down into this hall when we saw that canopy, it was, uh, a, a parachute has never looked at you before. <laughs> Did it look like I opened up a little lower than you thought? Not only lower, but you were so close to the edge when your chute opened, I thought you were going to slam into that wall. I just wanted to make sure there was no doubt about it that I was doing a subterranean freefall. Well, my friend, there's no doubt about it. You did a subterranean freefall, all right. Okay, you heard it. The black hole has been conquered. Now back to Stunt Central. As we said before, that we had a serious accident um, in Australia with our stunt skier, Jeff Carrington. And Jeff, we want to let you know that our love and prayers are with you. It was a great attempt. <laughs> now, remember the Black Hole's ancient legend that we heard earlier in the show? Yeah. Yeah? Well? Well, now the local <laughs> residents have got a new legend to pass on. The climbers tell us that it's 1,400 feet down into the hole, but it feels more like 1,400 miles when they climb back up. While BJ and Rick finish their grueling one-hour climb, let's take another look at the world's first subterranean freefall. we can get him. BJ. Yeah. Now that you've seen it firsthand, why don't you tell us what's your impression of the center of the earth? Most outrageous sight I've ever seen. <laughs> Love it. Well, it's certainly the most outrageous thing that I've ever seen. This is John Schneider saying goodbye to you from the black hole in Mexico. Well, that's it from the New River Gorge. Good night, everybody. That's it from New Zealand. Good night, everybody. From beautiful Mount Hood, Oregon, this is Greg Evigan saying, Good night. After the thrills and excitement of the last two hours, I think it's time for everybody to just take a deep breath and get our heartbeats back down to normal. So for all our stuntmen and crews from around the world, thanks for joining us from the world's greatest stunts. Good night, everybody. Good night. Drive safe. Travel arrangements by American Airlines with over 250 destinations worldwide. American Airlines, something special in the air. Saturday night, take a look at America's most glamorous city through the eyes of cops as cops returns to Los Angeles.
Then get ready to laugh out loud with Totally Hidden Video, Open House, and The Tracy Ullman Show. And don't forget, the laughs continue late night Saturday with America's funniest stand-up comedians on Comic Strip Live.